Good morning, First Congregational Church in Winchester. It's good to have you worshiping with us today. We hope you all are having a good summer. And as you might have seen in our weekly email, we'd like to ask you if you would consider sending us a picture or two or uploading it to our Google Drive. Um, a picture of a place that you are this summer or that you've been to that reveals the glory and the beauty of, of God's good earth. There is a link in the weekly email that you can upload the, a photo or two yourself, or you can send it to me or to Sarah in the office and we can upload it there. But it would be great if you would uh, s send those in and then come the fall, we're gonna find a way to use them um, creatively and share back with you during one of our, our worship services um, as, we, as we come back together. So next week, believe it or not, we have our last pre-recorded worship service. Then we'll have one more Zoom communion worship service live through Zoom at 10 o'clock the first Sunday of August. And and then we'll go hybrid, worshiping in the sanctuary for those who are comfortable doing so and live streamed for those who would prefer to stay remote. So that's our plan. But we're glad that you are here with us today and this week to worship together. And I would like to invite us to begin with a prayer. I'm going to have a little music going here. This opening, um, this opening prayer, our morning prayer for our worship, comes from Stephen Charleston, who is a retired Episcopal bishop, a Native American man, um, and it's adapted from one of his writings that comes um, that's in his book called Cloud Walking. So let us pray. We take each hour that your grace offers, eternal God, as though it were a single jewel to be threaded on the necklace of time. Each hour, like this one, has been made precious, a gift meant for us that takes the earthly edges of hard stone and polishes them to shine with the inner light of your spirit. May this hour and all our hours not be heavy-footed time, marching thoughtlessly through shadows, but sparkling chances given to discover hints of heaven in every waking moment. Help us to be alert to what we have received, knowing that all we ever need is in each hour, and we must only value it enough to care. As Jesus Christ taught us how to care, how to live, and how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And let us sing together to begin our worship. The words will appear on the screen in front of you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another time for the young. This is Jake using both she, her, and they, them pronouns. And today I want to talk a little bit about, well, I wanted to start by talking about this really cool salt shaker that I have. It looks like a hot air balloon. And the one of the coolest parts is it says Paris. You can see that there's I think one's for pepper and one's for salt. So, Jake, why are you telling us about your salt shaker and pepper shaker? Well, because my best friend got me for the, this for me when they were in France on vacation one year. And in case you hadn't realized, and it'd be kind of difficult with this heat, it's summer. And everyone has had a couple weeks now, uh, at least... All you kids have had a couple weeks of summer vacation. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit because, you know, when, when the pandemic first started and lockdown first started, I thought part of my brain was like, oh my goodness, this is like a vacation that's going to last who knows how long. Yippee! And I was wrong, of course, but I've talked to people about that and other people felt like that too, that p part of... Part of me, at least, and part of some other people were thinking, wow, finally some time to just... <sighs> the thing about vacation is that it, it... And the thing about time off is that it's not really as fun unless you were working or doing something and then you came to the vacation. There's something different about this summer, I feel, because we've started going back to school, going back to work, and I feel we're really appreciating this time off in a different way than maybe we would before. Um, you know, this is something that's talked about in the Bible. The One of the very first thing God does is say, the seventh day is for rest. Sure, work for those six days, but the seventh day is for rest, and you shouldn't work that day. So I just want to remind everybody that, you know, it's okay, even after having this weird year and kind of half going back to school and and, and things starting up in weird ways, it's still okay and actually good for you to take this time, this summer, to really just rest. It's been a difficult year. It's been a difficult few years for us. Um, and I just want to remind us that we can, we can always take time for ourselves. But it's also important to, to get back to the busy work that, that, that is just as important for us to feel okay. So I thought we could end our time together here with a little prayer. 
God, thank you for work and for play and for rest. Thank you for making us the kinds of creatures among many other creatures who all need times of activity, times of stress, but good stress, healthy stress, and also creatures who need times of play and relaxation and uh, doing things that bring us peace and, and serenity in a way that is, does not feel pressured. We pray all this through your child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. This is a reading from a portion of Psalm 89. I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Savior. And I will appoint him to be my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees, and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. Good morning. This is a reading from the second Samuel chapter seven. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in the house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all of the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell me, servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. 
I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Good morning. It's good to be with you all today. For those who don't know me, my name is Julia Page, and I grew up going to this church. Long ago, I sometimes used to play the cello for these summer services. Now I'd like to thank Judy and Will for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. May God be present with each of us. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of 2 Samuel. David has just had the Ark of the Covenant brought up to Jerusalem, rejoicing and dancing as it arrives. He is settled in his palace, and verse 1 says that the Lord has given him rest from all his enemies. Though today's passage comes before the story of David violating Bathsheba and subsequently murdering her husband Uriah in the text of 2 Samuel, it is believed that the chapter we're reading today comes after those events chronologically, towards the end of David's reign. David has a time of rest, and he now wants to do something for God. Knowing that God is much higher and more powerful than him, he feels that the Ark of God should not be housed in a tent while he lives in a fancy palace made of cedar. And common sense says this is a good idea, a way to please and honor God. And David's prophet, Nathan, initially supports it. But then Nathan receives a word from the Lord, telling him that David should not build the temple. So why is that? God asks of David, are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? While we don't get much explanation here in 2 Samuel of what God means, David explains this more fully to his son Solomon, who ultimately will build the temple, when the same events are recounted in 1 Chronicles. He says, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me, You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. God goes on to explain that David's son, a man of peace and rest, will build the temple. Remember, at this point, David has war blood on his hands, as well as having committed a grave sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. But God has not abandoned him. God continues to bless him. In our reading today, God promises to make David's name great to give him a homeland for his people and rest from their enemies, and offspring who will be raised up to form an everlasting kingship. But David is not to build the temple. He has shed too much blood. In this, we see that the shedding of blood has consequences. Because of his history, David is not the right person to build the temple. His role instead is to be a ruler and king. Even as God forgives and blesses David, this forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin. Our personal and corporate sins across history continue to affect us in racism, discrimination, and ongoing spilling of blood. This blood then cries out. In Genesis, when Cain kills Abel, the Lord says to him, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Here too, God says to David that he has shed blood in my sight. When the world seems not to care about loss or injustice, God sees it. Even though much of the blood on David's hands seems to be justified as necessary for the people of Israel to defeat their enemies, the loss of life is still mournful and tainting. Like David, we are sinful people, 
but God offers us an unending wealth of mercy and grace. Even as we accept this grace, we too must remember the blood for which our collective histories make us responsible. Now, the second reason that David is not to build a temple for the Lord is that God never asked him for one. God reminds David that he has been dwelling in a tent since the exodus from Egypt. And he asks David, wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? We see here in God's response that even if something is a good task, that doesn't necessarily mean that God wants us to do it. Building the temple is a good thing, and it's not even that God's desire to do it is warped or self-serving. It simply is not the task that God desires for him. Instead, it is for his son Solomon to build. How often are we more fixated on it being us doing the good task than on the goodness of the task itself. I'm currently a PhD student working in a biology lab. In academia, there's a lot of pressure to publish, to have one's name on novel and impactful work. Sometimes in that environment, it's easy to lose track of the joy and purpose of the work itself and the wonder of learning. Am I as happy about my collaborators' discoveries as my own? David, however, does not respond with frustration when told he should not build the temple, but happily cedes the task to Solomon. Admittedly, he was just promised a great name, among other things. But in any case, he contributes to the task as is fitting for him. In 1 Chronicles, we see that he does make preparations for the temple's building, including providing lots of building materials and resources but he does not receive the glory of having built the temple. Can we too celebrate good endeavors as much when someone else does them as when we do them ourselves? I pray that we may celebrate all good work to the glory of God. We should also seek to elevate those who are often overlooked. David, after all, was a shepherd boy before God chose to make his name great. Now, if there are good tasks that we shouldn't do because they're not what God has ordained for us, how do we decide what to do? Does it not make sense that it would be ideal for the good to come as quickly as possible? If David could build the temple, why wait for Solomon? I don't have the answers, but since I'm writing this sermon, I'll share a few thoughts. In general, I'm someone who believes that we sometimes spend too much time looking for our particular calling, waiting for some kind of sign, when there are multiple options that all fall within God's will for our lives. But clearly here, there is a good task, one that is right for Solomon, but which would be sin for David because it would be disobedience to God. So what do we do? How do we decide what tasks are for us? First, it is clear that we should be in communication with God. While we might not hear a direct word from God, like Nathan does in this passage, if we are in communication with him through consistent prayer, we put our plans before him and open ourselves to his voice. Next, we should seek and be responsive to wise counsel. God does not give his word directly to David, despite it being about David's plans. He gives it to Nathan. David, in turn, listens to and trusts Nathan, even when his counsel changes. So let's find wise friends. Let's pray consistently, think carefully, talk to others and be open to their counsel, and then act, making decisions and trusting God to be with us. And we should be particularly thoughtful when these decisions are as impactful as building a temple to the Lord which would house the Ark of the Covenant and be a centerpiece of religious and community life for the people of Israel. We should keep in mind that not all good tasks are ours to do. Furthermore, even as we work for God's kingdom, we must remember that God has already accomplished the most important work for us. In God's response to David, we are reminded that God is sufficient. He doesn't need a house. While David wants to offer something to God, 
It is ultimately God who promises and provides his people a home, not the other way around. In our passage, God reminds David of what he has already done for him. He says, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. David went from being a shepherd boy tending his family's flocks to being the great king over Israel with victory over the surrounding nations. God here reminds him that that was all God's doing and not by David's own strength. Similarly, through the cross, Jesus has already accomplished what we could not, despite striving all our lives. We cannot earn our own salvation, and God doesn't need us, but he allows us to participate in his work nonetheless. After God reminds David of what he has done for him, he then gives David promises about the future. Among other things, he says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Though David will not build the temple, his son will, and his line will continue forever. This prophecy is fulfilled not only in Solomon, but ultimately in Jesus, who descends from David's line and whose kingdom will be established eternally. We too can stop to first look at the past and remember what God has done, both in our own lives and throughout history. The stories of scripture are our stories. In Romans, Paul writes, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we have been adopted into God's family, though we might not be Jews, we inherit the history of his people. This includes the bloodshed and the sin, but we also inherit God's promises to his people. Sometimes I think we get confused about what those promises are. Sometimes Christian women of my age will make comments to other single women like, your future husband's out there. You just have to wait for God to bring him to you. When I'd hear this, I'd often think, well, if I'm going to get married, then yes, that's true, because I'm not marrying someone more than two decades younger than me. But God never promised marriage, at least not to me. To some people, he may make specific promises but he never promised me a particular job or children or good health. He never promised we would be free from pain or hardship. In fact, he said we will suffer in this world, but he did promise to be faithful. In Psalm 89, God says of David, I will maintain my love to him forever and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. Whatever David and his sons might do, God will be faithful. He is trustworthy and true to his word. It may not always feel like it, The psalmist actually goes on to say he feels rejected and spurned, 
that God has broken his covenant. But with our broader vantage point, we can see that God was faithful, even as the consequences of David's sin continued to play out in devastating events with his children towards the end of his life. After the part of Psalm 89 that we read, there is a word, Salah, before the psalmist continues. The meaning of the word Salah is somewhat unknown, but it was likely a musical indication indicating a rest, a pause, a point at which to stop, that was included to emphasize what came right before. So may we hear these promises, which have been established like the moon, which stands as a witness in the night sky, and stop, to look back and remember our histories, including the blood, and then look ahead with the knowledge of God's promises. And he has promised us a king in the line of David who will reign forever, one whose blood can wash away all the rest. Thank you. So now we come to our time of community prayer. We pray words together through my mouth at this time. Um, and we also have the opportunity of praying for those names and situations that are on the prayer list that you'll find at the end of your bulletin and in the weekly Thursday email. And we invite you to keep those names and situations in your prayers and to add your own if um, need be through the church office or one of the pastors. So let us um, be at prayer. We come before you now with all our defenses dropped, gracious God. Those 
deep in sorrow come seeking comfort and meaning. We who are doubting come, hoping for a spark to ignite our faith. Our anxious ones desire the reassurance of your presence. Those who worry over the pain and path of those they love ask for your healing. Lovers of our earth and our country come listening for your call to action. Lovers of humanity we seek partnership with those unknown to us and assurance that no one is unknown to you. In seeking these things, we desire to draw closer to you, to live our lives in constant, constant awareness of you, and to be an agent of your love and peace in the world. Gracious God, we pray with gratitude and praise, and in the name of our Savior, Jesus, your Son, and our Christ. Amen. And I invite you now to join in the um, closing hymn, one of my favorites, All Things Bright and Beautiful. It is printed in the bulletin. It scrolls on the screen, the words do, and it is also in the Black Covered New Century hymnal number 31. So please uh, join in our um, closing hymn, Praising Creation. Thank you, Julia Page, for that powerful sermon. Thank you, Cindy and Nick, for reading the scripture. And I thought this was a, a good thing for you to know that Nick and Cindy are Julia Page's godparents. So it's pretty cool to have them supporting Julia by reading the scripture ahead of time. Also good to have Judy back with us after a couple of weeks vacation. And we're so glad that you were able to tune in wherever and you were and however you did that. So I send you forth with some words from a Celtic benediction. Now may the courage of the early mornings dawn and the strength of the eternal hills at noontime 
and the peace of the open spaces at evening's ending, and the love of God and the care for the earth abide in your hearts now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.